Hello, welcome to the EPG Patshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Professor, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I am the principal investigator of this project. We are now going to listen to a discussion of a module from the course Introduct An Introduction to Linguistics. The coordinator of the course is Professor R. Amritavalli, retired professor from English and Foreign Languages University, New Delhi. The title of the module is The Mirror Principle and An Accusative, Ergative and the Antipassive. Listen to the discussion. Sorry. The author of the module is Professor R. Amritavalli, retired professor. English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. Listen to the discussion. <coughs> the mirror principle, the unaccusatives, ergatives, and the antipassive. We have already seen in the previous modules that the field of morphosyntax was born in response to two findings. First, some morphology has to be done in the syntax anyway, namely inflectional morphology. And second, derivational morphology induces syntactic regularities in the selectional frames of related words as well as changes of grammatical functions or relations no less than syntactic operations do. The first point raised the question whether it was possible to partition morphology into two watertight compartments, namely derivation occurring before syntax and inflection occurring after syntax. Theories of grammar that foregrounded grammatical functions and relations such as relational grammar and lexical functional grammar highlighted phenomena that generative linguists try to account for within the premises of generative grammar. The Mirror Principle A milestone in morphosyntax was Baker's articulation of the Mirror Principle which stated that morphological derivations must directly reflect syntactic derivations and vice versa. For a clear understanding of the mirror principle, Baker cited two examples of morphosyntactic operations, passive construction and causative and reflexive or reciprocal morphemes. Let us first have a look at passive construction. A syntactic operation like the passive, which moves a noun phrase into the subject position from a lower position in the sentence, has a morphological operation associated with it. Namely, the verb has to be affixed with the past participle and a verb B has to be introduced to carry tense. This past participle morphological marking on the verb of the passive was at first simply stipulated as part of the rule. Baker 1985 argued that the passive represented a class of rules for which the morphology and the syntax must be two aspects of a single process. He gave two examples to support this. The first example is from the Austro-Asian language Shamoro, where a prefix fan appears on the verb to mark agreement with the plural subject. This prefix appears only in an intransitive clause. The prefix appears on the passive verb in A, which has a schematic form as you can see in A. The children will be spanked by their father. We can say that fan appears in A, although the verb spank has two arguments and is underlyingly transitive because the passive is a detransitivizing rule. The pre prefix appears on the passivized verb, 
notice that it occurs outside the passive marker. In the second example, we can see that the morpheme fan attaches as a suffix in B, which on the surface is a transitive sentence. To explain the appearance of fan in B, we have to take into account that it is a causative sentence. There are two clauses and the inner clause them eat is intransitive. The verb eat is intransitive here. Note that fan appears inside the causative prefix but outside the verb eat. This explains how fan occurs in apparently transitive sentences but it actually prefixes only to an intransitive verb. Baker's second set of examples come from the South American Indian language Quechua. This language has causative and reflexive or re reciprocal morphemes. In C, these morphemes appear in the order reciprocal before causative. He is causing them to beat each other. In D, these morphemes appear in the order causative before rec reciprocal. They let someone beat each other. Baker contended that although the two sentences had practically the same morphemes, they have very different interpretations which arise from the relative order of the morphemes. Crucially, the operation that changed grammatical relations, moving the object into the subject position, adding a causative affix and a causa argument, are accompanied by morphological effects. The surface order of the morphemes tell us what changes in grammatical functions occur at which stage of the derivation. Baker therefore states the mirror principle that morphological derivations must directly reflect syntactic derivations and vice versa. If the mirror principle is not to be stipulated but is to be derived from more fundamental aspects of how the grammar is organized, Baker argues, the morphological and the syntactic processes considered here must take place in the same component of the grammar. This component is the syntax. Therefore, morphology occurs in the syntax. The unaccusative hypothesis An enduring hypothesis in generative grammar is that the class of intransitive verbs, as they were traditionally known, subdivides into two, a class of unnogative verbs and a class of unaccusative verbs. This is known as the unaccusative hypothesis and has been the subject of much discussion in syntax as well as acquisition. The unaccusative hypothesis was first advanced within the theory of relational grammar. Consider the sentences in 1 and 2. In 1, Lata runs, Mira speaks, the minister resigned. Here, the subjects of the intransitive verbs are agents or actors. Now consider the sentences in two. Arjun fell. The train arrived. The dog died. Here, the subjects of the intransitive verbs are patients or themes. That is, they undergo the action or the change of state, etc. Many languages morphologically distinguish the verb classes like 1 and 2 we saw earlier. Consider the examples from Assamese here. Rame doude, Ram pore, Rame kaam kore. We can see that the subjects of the verb in A are marked with E just as the subjects of the transitive verbs in C. The subject of the verbs in B are not marked with the suffix E. 
given the idea of the uniformity of theta assignment the subjects of verb like fall arrive and die which are patients rather than agents should be underlying objects of the verb the unaccusative hypothesis thus proposes that some intransitive verbs start out with internal subjects these are the unaccusative verbs unurgative verbs on the other hand take agentive subjects that start out as subject they are external arguments next in the aspect style theory the trees would look like this from the tree diagram shown we can see that the external argument is generated in a little way projection which can take a vp complement the vp complement may have just a v in it or a v and a np in it an additional argument for the unaccusative structure shown on the above diagram is that unaccusative verbs often have a transitive variant this alternation is also found in english although limited to a few verbs like drop move break etc given the structures above the intransitive verb break would occur as the v in the vp on the right and take an object for example broke the bottle because this intransitive verb does not assign accusative case the bottle would move into the position of the subject and receive a nominative case the transitive alternant of break would have this vp as a complement to little v it's the projection v bar would host the external argument the breaker and v would assign accusative case to the object ergatives and antipassive in our discussion of morphology we have mentioned case by now you must be familiar with the case names such as nominative and accusative in languages like english subjects have nominative case and objects have accusative case in english case is overtly seen only in the pronominal system for example he or she ran he or she caught him or her here he or she gets the nominative case whereas him or her gets the accusative case in english therefore subjects of sentences are always nominative whether the verb is transitive or intransitive however the languages of the world show an interesting difference in this respect in the so called ergative languages the subjects of transitive clauses have a different marker than the subject of intransitive clauses the subject of transitive clauses have the ergative case we have already seen ergative case in the assamese examples in the previous section Hindi and Kashmiri also mark the subject of transitive clauses with ergative case. Hindi does so only in the past tense. Consider the example from Hindi. Ram ne roti khai. Ram bhaga aur bhagya. Ram gira aur gir pada. Notice that in A the subject Ram is marked with the suffix ne. which is the ergative marker whereas in b and c the subject of an intransitive sentence is in hindi is not marked with the suffix ne in the intransitive sentences the verb agrees with the subject of the sentence ram bhaga ram gira now look at a ram ne roti khai Here we notice another interesting fact the verb agrees with the object of the sentence khai agrees with the object roti and not ram it has thus been proposed that the languages of the world differ in how they group together the subjects of intransitive and transitive sentences 
In nominative accusative languages, subjects are always grouped together. In ergative absolutive languages, the subject of an intransitive clause and the object of a transitive clause are grouped together. This is known as ergative alignment. Summary We have seen that where a syntactic operation is accompanied by a morphological reflex, the order in which the morphological elements occur reflects the order of the syntactic operations. This means that the morphology and the syntax must go together in a single morphosyntactic operation. There is no separate morphological component. The unaccusative hypothesis is supported by evidence from morphology and syntax. It partitions the class of intransitive verbs into those with agentive subjects, these are called the unnegative verbs, and those with subjects which undergo an action or a change of state. The latter are called unaccusative verbs and are generated as objects. Languages differ in how they case mark the subjects and objects of transitive and intransitive sentences. In nominative accusative languages, the subject is always nominative, whether the clause is transitive or intransitive. In ergative absolutive languages, the subjects of transitive clauses which are agentive are marked with ergative case. The intransitive subject and the transitive object may have the same case marking, which is absolutive, and trigger verb agreement as in Hindi past tense clause. Summary So we have seen what the unacquisitive hypothesis is and how do languages differ in relation to these verbs, namely ergative, an accusative and so on. <clears throat> I'm sorry, please cut. Again, summary. <clears throat> the unaccusative hypothesis is supported by evidence from morphology and syntax. This is what has been discussed in this module. The hypothesis partitions the class of intransitive verbs into those with agentive suffixes and those with subjects which undergo an action or a change of state, the latter are called unaccusative verbs and generated as objects. Languages differ in how they case mark the subjects and objects of transitive and intransitive sentences. In nominative accusative languages, the subject is always nominative, whether the clause is transitive or intransitive. We saw that in ergative absolutive languages, the subjects of transitive clauses which are agentive are marked with ergative case. The intransitive subject and the transitive object may have the same case marking, namely absolutive, and trigger verb agreement as we saw in the Hindi past tense clause. Thank you.